Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We continue in our series in Luke's Gospel, and we're going to be turning now to Luke chapter 14 and verses 25 to 35. Luke chapter 14, beginning to read at verse 25 to the end of the chapter. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus, and turning to them he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and he's not able to finish it, everyone who will sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able, with 10,000 men, to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure heap. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. We thank God for the blessing of his word. Let's pray. Father, in the peace of our country, we thank you this morning that we can read your word, the Bible, that we have time to sit, to listen to you, and to absorb what you're trying to say to us. Father, we do this morning think of those for whom today that is not the reality of their experience of Sunday morning worship. Father, we pray for those who today are fighting for their very lives. Christian brothers and sisters who on this day would ordinarily be together as a church. And yet there are families that are separated. There are people whose churches are torn apart. Lord, we pray for them. That just as we are able to enjoy the peace and being able to read your word, so too we pray that they might also experience that wherever they are. That Lord, they may know your presence And that even in their own hearts, they might be able to worship you and experience peace and joy. Father, we join with them as today we worship you in this way. Help us, Lord, to make the most of this time. Having read your word, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts through it. That, Father, we might become more like you and that we might be more effective in our witness in future days. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So three weeks ago, we left Jesus in a house of the Pharisees, a man of importance in the religious world, and he was having a dinner party. And we looked at the subject of healing on the Sabbath. Jesus talked about seating plans, and he talked about the guest list of who we should invite to meals. And Jesus taught us, didn't he, about humility in service. And back in January, when we started this whole part two series again, having left it for Christmas, we started out on a road that set out for Jerusalem. There was a turning point in Luke's Gospel and we said that uh, Jesus had set out for uh, Jerusalem and that he'd done so resolutely. There was a commitment to what he was doing. And after our break in the series now for the last couple of weeks, we once again are going to journey along with Jesus along another road. And this time we're looking at the cost of discipleship. So we're on a road. Imagine this morning we're going to be walking together with Jesus. If you didn't bring your walking boots, don't worry. It's just a gentle stroll. We're not going for a big long walk. There's an overlap, isn't there, between the two, commitment and cost. They're obviously important. And so Jesus continually teaches about these things as he moves along this road towards Jerusalem. And this morning, I've got to say, it comes with a warning. I think I said this to you when we talked about commitment. This is a tough subject, because three times, if you didn't notice, three times in this scripture, Jesus lays out conditions. And he says, if you don't meet those conditions, you cannot, cannot be my disciple. Serious stuff, isn't it? 
Now, I'm not here today to tell you if you meet those conditions. What Jesus lays out for us and what we're going to look at this morning is those conditions. But this morning, you must ask yourself and answer the question, am I meeting the conditions of discipleship? Am I prepared to meet the cost? Or is the cost too great? Is the cost of discipleship too great? But I want us to keep in mind throughout this morning that this passage is really all about good news. This is good news for you and I this morning. Yes, it's tough, but right throughout this, I want you to keep in mind that if we are meeting the conditions of being a disciple and following Jesus, this is very good news. Because there is a lot that we will be rewarded with. There are a lot of blessings to be had this morning. And boy, do we need that in the world today, don't we? So there is good news this morning throughout this passage. Dr. Luke tells us that Jesus was traveling, his disciples were with him, and he's got this great crowd of people who are following him. Not surprising, really, is it? Because he's been doing miracles, he's been doing this amazing teaching, and he's been giving people this message of life and hope. It was a far cry from the, from the Roman oppressors of the day and the way that they wanted to, to rule their lives. And it was very much different than what the religious leaders gave to them because this was a living faith. This was, this was something that the religious leaders of the day knew very little about. And Jesus was bringing life and, and vitality to this message of faith and hope. And you know, if we had got that great crowd that was following us this morning, I think that we would be quite pleased. Kingdom growth, we're looking for it, aren't we? Uh, in aim, we'd love to have lots of people here. And, and when you're not careful, we can tend to measure success by the number of people. And we'd feel that God was blessing us if the people were out the door. And we'd probably keep on doing what we've been doing. So I want us to picture Jesus. I want us to walk with him this morning with this great crowd that is following him. The disciples are there. Can you imagine the hustle and the bustle, the excitement that was going on as we walk along that road? Because we, we, we're listening to what Jesus is saying. And is he going to say something else in a minute? Is he going to stop? Is he going to heal somebody? What's going to happen now? What an exciting life. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops. And he says, if anyone comes after me who does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, you cannot be my disciple. Can you imagine? Can you imagine walking along that road, all that excitement and Jesus saying that? Did you imagine that this was, could you hear what Jesus is saying? Did, did you understand what he just said? Did I hear that correctly? What Jesus has just said to the crowd? Can you imagine him stopping and people bumping into each other and saying, hang on a minute, just repeat that again, Jesus. What was Jesus doing? What was he thinking? If he was a salesman, he wasn't a very good one, was he? This isn't a great pitch, is it, for following him? It seems that he's got this great crowd that we'd be pleased to have, and yet somehow he seems to be frightening them away. But yet context, again, is always important, isn't it? Jesus was speaking to this crowd, and the culture of the day was based upon the family connections that you had defined you as a person. So who you were related to was really, really important because it defined you. And that he just said to this crowd with that context, that, that belief in the society, that unless a person hated his family, he couldn't be a disciple of Jesus. This was serious stuff. And I've got to tell you, it's still serious stuff this morning, 2,000 years later. Now then, before you decide that a faith that tells you to hate your family is not one for you and you get up and walk out, just let's pause a moment and let me explain what Jesus was meaning. Let me be absolutely clear, Jesus doesn't want you or them to hate anyone. How could he? His whole teaching, if you think about it, the fifth commandment in the Bible, the commandments is about honouring your father and mother. So he's now not going to say, you've got to hate them. That, that makes no sense. And neither is Jesus, the one who said, suffer little children to come unto me, going to say to their mums and dads, you know, hate your children. And neither is Jesus, the one who said, you've got to love your enemies, now going to tell you that you've got to hate your family. It doesn't make sense, does it? So that's not what Jesus was saying he doesn't want you or them to hate anybody so what was he saying what was Jesus saying well it's not so much about hating your family or yourself as it is about how much we should love God and put him first see Jesus was getting their attention and he was saying that we should love God so much that by comparison even our own families it would feel that we were hating them that's how much he wants us to love God and put him first. It's not about hating them, but he's saying by comparison, 
I want you to love me so much that it seems that even the nearest and dearest to you, that it, by comparison it would be hating them. And he says, if you don't do that, you cannot be my disciples. It seems in this great crowd that there were people who were following, but they weren't really committed. Jesus knew that. And he knew what lay ahead. And, and he was starting to challenge these people who were on the fringes. And Jesus was setting out for them that if they were going to be a disciple, that there was a cost. There was a cost. A cost in terms of their relationships. If they were going to follow Jesus, he was letting them know that he had to be the most important relationship that they had. More important than the mum, the dad, the wife, the kids, the husband, the children, more important than themselves even. Jesus had to be number one. And Jesus had to be so much more important, so much more love, that by comparison it would seem that they hated everybody else. Because he wanted you to see that all other relationships must take second place to Jesus. And so it should be with you and I. Our loyalty to God has got to be greater than it is to our husband, our wife, our kids, our parents, and our nearest and dearest. You see, the problem we encounter is that we rightly love our spouses and our kids and our parents, but we can end up, if we're not careful, loving them more than we love God. You see, as our kids are growing up, how much more time do we spend in the car taking them back into to football or ballet each week than we do over an entire month praying for their souls? And how much time do we spend visiting parents and ensuring that shopping is done each week than we do in a month praying about their souls? And how much more time do we spend trying to please our husband or our wife each week than we do praying about their spiritual growth and well-being? By these comparisons, it can reveal, can't it, how much we love our families, perhaps more than we love and put first God. You see, we're putting the family's needs before we're putting what God wants us to do. But you see, and get this this morning, the real paradox is this, that the proper way to love our families is to hate them because our greater love of God will then enable us to love them the very best that we can. Did we get that? That's the paradox. That the more we love God, the more we're able to love them. And I want you to think what your most precious relationship is this morning. Ask yourself right now, who is it I love the most in the world? And, if that part, and ask yourself, does that person matter more to you than Jesus? Because if they do, Jesus is saying this morning, sadly, you cannot be his disciple. Not me. It's Jesus that's saying that. Now then, Jesus didn't want to frighten the crowd away any more than he wants to frighten you and I away this morning. But he wanted them and us to know that there is a cost to discipleship. And the cost is firstly in prioritising our relationships and putting Jesus above all else. And please remember that important fact that when we do, when we put Jesus first and love him the most, it enables us to love and care for our family in the very best way possible. So, there's a cost in our terms of our relationships. Jesus goes on to the crowd. Boy, can you imagine now how much they were listening? Are you listening this morning? Did you hear it? You're banging into the people around you as you're trying to get near to Jesus? Because Jesus now says, verse 27, he says, And anyone who doesn't carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Wow. Jesus goes further. This is a sacrificial cost now, isn't it? You see, for the crowd on the road that day, the cross wasn't a symbolic piece of jewellery that they hang around their necks. The cross was an instrument of torture and death. Someone carrying their own cross in public was on a one-way road to death. There was no escape. They were at the hands of somebody else. They carried it until they were crucified upon it. Life was not their own anymore. And this, as Jesus knew, was where he was heading on the road that he was actually walking to that very day. Ultimately, he was heading towards the cross. And Jesus told them plainly that if they didn't carry their own cross and follow him, that they cannot be his disciple. Now, did that mean that they all had to be crucified? No, of course it didn't. Some were, by the way, of course. They went all the way to, in the same way that Jesus did, but it didn't mean that. So what does it mean? It means that if we want to become a Christian and follow Jesus, 
that we have to die to self. We in effect have to consider ourselves as dead. Our life is no longer our own. We submit to God and we give it all to him when we become a Christian. And if you think that becoming a Christian is a life of ease, then think again, because I'm going to tell you the truth, it isn't. It wasn't easy for Jesus, and if we're going to follow him, we shouldn't expect it to be any different than it was for him. It's a life of self-denial, denying self. Denying what we want in favour of what Jesus wants. It means surrendering all of our lives, the bad and the good, and it means we have to surrender everything sacrificially. No exceptions. Everything surrendered to God. Once again, Jesus wants us to know what we're getting into. He wants us to know what the cost of being a disciple actually is. And he speaks plainly when he tells us that we have to take up our cross and we have to follow him. That means that where we live, what job we do, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, the car we drive, the places we choose to go, the person we marry, the children we have, it's all God's. All of it. The choice is not ours. We're saying to God, I want to be your disciple and I'm prepared to allow you to determine every aspect of my entire life. It's a sacrificial cost to be a disciple of Jesus. And if we don't pick up that cross and if we don't follow him, he tells us plain and simple, we cannot be his disciple. And there's no negotiation to be had. There's no offering part of our life. Oh, you can have my career, Lord, but you're not having my car. You, you can have my house, Lord, but you can't have my Man United season ticket. Oh, no. There's no negotiation to be had. It's literally all or nothing. Nothing. Not even being a disciple. And once again, this is not about scaring us off. It's about being honest and upfront. You see, there's no small print in the contract when you become a disciple. It's right there on the front. It says in bold type on the front page, there is a cost of being a disciple. Take up your cross and follow me. And Jesus says there's a cost to your relationship and it's a cost which is sacrificial. It means surrendering everything. Jim Elliot, some of you have been reading Elizabeth Elliot's account of her husband's life, the missionary, and have quoted this quote before. It was a life that was cut short as a missionary. He, he, he was only there a few months before the people he'd gone to rescue murdered him. But before he went, he said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And this is the good news, friends. Carrying your cross and dying to self is a good thing. It's the very best thing, in fact, because it makes us more like Jesus. The things that you'll sacrifice in this life are nothing, absolutely has nothing compared to what God is going to reward you with in the next life. And nothing compared to how he's going to bless you in this life. Hope, encouragement, guidance, blessings, comfort in sickness, peace in bereavement, joy in the midst of a broken and fallen world which is tearing itself apart in war and strife and hatred. The enormous benefits of belonging to Jesus are that he is in control, as we've already heard this morning, and that we get the blessing because he remains with us and he stays with us. But does this mean that we have to go home and give up work and give everything physically away to Jesus? Well, for some, maybe. Maybe that's what the Lord will call you or me to do. But for others, no, it doesn't automatically mean that. It means that our view of these things is that they are all secondary to Jesus, who is number one. And we do what he wants us to do with our life, but that we make all of what he's blessed us with in this life available to him to serve him. Do you know, I like the way that Juan Carlos Oritz, who's a Christian author, a minister, who he writes the story, he tells the story of the Pearl of Great Price. I'll repeat it for you here. You see, a man sees the, this pearl and he says to the merchant, I want that pearl, how much is it? And the seller says, oh, it's very expensive. He says, how much? He said, it's a lot. He said, well, do you think I could buy it? The man asks. Oh, yes, says the merchant, everyone can buy it. But I thought you said it was very expensive. I did. Well, how much is it? Everything you have, says the seller. All right, I'll buy it. Okay, what do you have? Well, I've got $10,000 in the bank. Good, $10,000. What else? Well, that's all I have. Nothing more. Well, I've got a few dollars in my pocket. How much? Well, let's see. $100. 
That's mine too, says the seller. What else do you have? That, that's all, nothing else. Where do you live, the seller asks. In my house, I own a home. The seller writes down house, it's mine. Where do you expect me to sleep? In my camper. Oh, you've got a camper van, have you? That too, what else? Well, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to sleep in my car. Oh, you've got a car. Yes, I've got two. They're both mine now. Look, you've taken me money, you've taken me house, you've taken me camper, and you've taken me cars. Where's my family going to live? Oh, so you've got a family, have you? Yeah, I've got wife and three kids. Right, they're all mine too. And suddenly the seller explain, explains to this guy, he says, I almost forgot. You, yourself, too. Everything becomes mine. Wife, children, house, money, cars, and you too. And then he goes on, now listen to this. I will allow you to use all of these things for the time being. But don't forget, they're all mine, just as you are. And whenever I need any of them, you must give them up. Because I am now the owner. To illustrate his point, as he walked along that road, Jesus told two parables. And the first is personal. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Nothing wrong with building a tower, that's not the point here. The first thing is to sit down and to estimate the cost, to see if you've got enough money to complete it. If you lay the foundation, must have been a reasonably big tower, probably it was one of these towers that overwatched the vineyard or watchtower, and, and, but if you build it and you only get the foundation done and you don't have enough money to finish the project, then those watching you are going to ridicule you. And this fellow began to build and was not able to finish and they would say to him, well, you were a bit foolish because you didn't really think it through, did you? Jesus told them about the cost and he was now telling them and you and I that they must count or weigh up the cost before they set out, before they start. Now, in church, of course, we're keen, eager to tell others about Christianity. And as part of our evangelism, we can enter, if we're not careful, into a bit of a sales pitch. You know, can't we? It's very easy to do that, isn't it? We start to sell our belief. Come to Jesus and all your problems will be sorted. And you know, there's even church to go further than that with the prosperity gospel and say, if you give it all to God, he'll give you so much more back. You'll even be physically rich in this life. And the gospel says, according to them, that we can expect financial blessing. And before long, we go down this road and we start selling this religion and, and it's a, a life of trouble-free, illness-free, debt-free, prosperous life. Come to Jesus, life is easy. And it's not. It's not easy. It's not easy being a Christian. You see, we still live in a fallen world. We'll have to turn on the TV screen and we see what's going on in Ukraine and the hatred and the violence and the war. And we look around and we're still going to face all the problems that other people face. We're still going to get the gas and the electricity bills rising. We're still going to get illness. We're still going to encounter death. We're still going to face all these problems. And maybe along the way, if you set out thinking it was all a breeze, you're going to start to realise, hey, well, actually, I wasn't told about all this. I wasn't expecting any of this. Jesus should have made it a bit better than this. It's not what we were sold. And Jesus is saying, you must count the cost before setting out. You need to know that there is a cost, and you need to be prepared. And as a church, we must set that out clearly to people. No point trying to sell people a lie. We've got to be honest, as Jesus is being honest with his crowd, we need to tell them there's a cost to being a Christian. But there's also a massive amount of reward that goes with that cost. And as we journey along the road, we need to share that with people. But we need to make sure that they're prepared. In 1845, there's a guy called Sir John Franklin, he was in the Royal Navy. And he took 138 officers and men, and he embarked from England to find the Northwest Passage across the high Canadian Arctic to the Pacific Ocean. And they sailed in two three-masted barks, these particular type of ships. And each sailing vessel carried an auxiliary steam engine. And they took with them just 12 days supply of coal for the entire project that was supposed to last two to three years of a voyage. And instead of the additional coal that they could have loaded up the ships, according to L.P. Kerwin, each made room for, listen to the list of things they took with them, 1,200 volume library, a hand organ playing 50 tunes, china play settings for officers and men, cut glass wine goblets, and sterling silver flatware. 
The office of sterling silver knives, forks and spoons were particularly interesting. The silver one was of ornate Victorian design, very heavy at the handles and richly patterned. Engraved on the handles were the individual officers' initials and family crests. And the expedition carried no special clothing for the Arctic, only the uniforms of Her Majesty's Navy. The ship set out in high spirits, with a massive glory and fanfare from people waving them off. Two months later, a British whaling captain met the two ships in Lancaster Sound and reported back to England on the high spirits of the officers and men. He was the last European to see them all alive. Years later, civilization learned that many groups of Eskimos had hazarded across tableaus involving various still living or dead members of the Franklin expedition. Some of them glimpsed, for example, men pushing a wooden boat across the ice. Eskimos found at a place called Starvation Cove, ultimately this boat, and the remains of 35 men who'd been dragging it. At Terror Bay, the Inuit found a tent on the ice, and in it were 30 bodies. At Simpson Strait, some Eskimos had seen a very odd sight, the packed ice pierced by the three protruding wooden masks of the ship. And for 20 years, subsequently, people's search parties discovered skeletons from all over the frozen sea. Accompanying one clump of frozen bodies were place settings of silver flatware engraved with the officers' initials and family crests. Another search party found two skeletons in a boat on a sledge. They'd hauled the boat 65 miles with the two skeletons with some chocolate, some guns, some tea and a great deal of table silverware that they tried to rescue. Many miles south of these two was another skeleton alone. This was a frozen officer. The skeleton was in uniform. Trousers and jackets of fine blue cloth edged with silk braid with silver slashed bearing five covered buttons on the sleeves. Over the uniform, the dead man had worn a blue greatcoat with a blue silk neckerchief. That was the Franklin expedition. Sir John Franklin and 138 officers of men had perished because they under underestimated the requirements of the Arctic exploration. They ignorantly imagined that a, a pleasure cruise amid the comforts of their English officers' clubs. They exchanged the necessities for luxuries and their ignorance led to their deaths. It almost sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? That the Royal Navy would set out on such an expedition in such a way with a lack of preparation that they did. But friends, it's even more ridiculous that people want to set out to be a disciple of Jesus without having prepared by counting the cost. A cost we're told by Jesus, which needs to be sacrificial. Those who set out with great enthusiasm following Jesus and along the way give up, do nothing to help advance the cause of Jesus as they bring humiliation on themselves. Jesus didn't want that and he warned them to, to count the cost. In short, basically, he said it's better not to set out at all than to set out and to give up. And Jesus then told a second parable, this time about a king, 10,000 men, who's been attacked by an army with 20,000 men. Will he not first sit down, says Jesus, and weigh up whether he could take them on or whether he's going to need to sue for peace? And if he can't beat them, well, he's going to sit down while the man's still a long way off and he's going to send a delegation. He's asking for terms of peace. Now then, it's suggested that this meaning of this second parable is less certain than the first. Interestingly, on the face of it, it's really just another illustration of sitting down and uh, someone sitting down and counting the cost before they go and do something. But one commentator suggests that it's actually a bit more of a hidden meaning than that. It's suggested that Jesus is urging the crowd to recognise who he is, the Messiah, the King of Kings, and then to submit to him. So the king with the 20,000 is Jesus, and we are the one with the 10,000, and we realise the inevitable stupidity of trying to resist Jesus, and the idea is, in the parable, he suggests that we would sit down and we would come to the right conclusion with Jesus and submit to him. Whether this is the meaning of that part of the parable, I'm not sure. But it certainly makes sense for us to submit to Jesus and not to resist him when we seek to follow him. Do you know, I imagine just for a minute, this large crowd is stood around Jesus on this road. 
And on the journey, it's been temporarily halted as Jesus stopped and he's broken this life-changing bolt of lightning, if you like, to these people. And the second parable that must have been sinking in what it was that Jesus was trying to say to them. You see, in this parable, of course, this second parable, whatever it's about, the stakes are higher, aren't they? It's not just about being personally humiliated. The guy, if he takes them on, he's going to end up losing men. He's going to lose life. He could lose his kingdom. He could lose his own life. He stands to lose everything. The stakes have just got higher. So he must weigh up. He must ask himself a question. Does the potential reward justify the tremendous risk? What will gain be gained by the price that's going to be paid? Is it going to be worth it is the question. And I guess this morning that we've got to pause on our journey with Jesus and the question that you've got to ask yourself and I have this morning is this. Does Jesus seem worth it to you? Does Jesus seem worth it to you? Before you answer, we need to remind ourselves again what the rewards are. Because I told you at the start, this is about good news, and it is. You see, we need to remind ourselves that the, the cost of relationship and the sacrificial cost bring with it its own rewards. It brings us forgiveness. Forgiveness for the sin which is in our lives and prevents us from having a relationship with our creator. Freedom from the guilt of that sin so that we can live this life here and now in hope and joy as we look forward to the life which is to come. It brings us love, the love of a God that means no matter how hard life is, no matter what we sacrifice, that his love will be ours, which gives us more than all this world could ever afford to give us. No matter what we face in this life, the love of God is constant and will remain with us. It means that we're adopted into God's family. Sins forgiven, loved, embraced, cherished by God himself, welcomed into his family with all its blessings and privileges. It means eternal life, not punishment and separation. Life eternal with all its blessings, lived out in the presence of a holy God. No more pain, no more tears, no more sadness. Perfect in the presence of the living God. Does Jesus seem worth the cost? He says that you must be prepared to pay to be his disciple. Is he worth the cost to you this morning? As the breeze blows over them as they stand there on that dusty road under the warm sun, Jesus repeats for a third time, as if they hadn't heard it already enough, he says for a third time, in the same way, if any of you who does not give up everything, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't know if any of that great crowd slipped away thinking, cost is too much for me and disappear. And maybe you're thinking this morning, well, this is all a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? Jesus has got this great crowd there, and it seems that he's doing his best, and then there's going to end up being fewer people following Jesus. And yes, that might be true. Fewer people might follow Jesus, but the truth of it is that we need to understand is that there won't be fewer people finishing. There won't be fewer people finishing. You see, Jesus is making it clear what the cost is. And he's asking us to ensure we understand before setting out on this journey because he, what he wants for us is to finish the journey, not to turn back, not to give up. You see, Jesus' journey wasn't about him gaining popularity. It wasn't about him getting acclaim or riches. It was about doing his father's will. He was on the way to his death on a cross at Calvary. He was on that road to Jerusalem. Why? So that you and I might live. So that you and I might know freedom. That we might know eternal life. And in the same way, our life is not about us. It's not about popularity or riches or acclaim. It's about cross-carrying. It's knowing the cost and seeing that Jesus is our reward and that he far outweighs anything that this world affords. As we come to a conclusion this morning, Jesus gave them one more illustration. It's about salt. And he asked the question, he said, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's fit for nothing. It just gets thrown out. Well, I'm told that sodium chloride, if you're a chemist, you can correct me afterwards, but I'm told that salt, sodium chloride, is a stable compound. And that technically, salt cannot lose its saltiness. So could it be that Jesus meant for us to realise that we are either a Christian and therefore a disciple who is committed to follow whatever the cost, or if we're not prepared to commit to the cost, that we weren't a Christian in the first place. And that at the final judgment, we will be, as it were, thrown out into hell 
away from the glory of heaven. You see, there are to be no half measures. Alternatively, what it could mean is the way that salt might be termed as losing its saltiness in the day, sometimes it got mixed with clay and mud and all sorts of other things, and the intensity of it, sort of, the impurities made it was diluted almost, thus losing its saltiness. And it's true that at times in this life, you and I, we will struggle with sin and we may find that the intensity of our devotion is not perhaps what it should be. But our desire and our intention should always be to follow Jesus completely. No half measures. We're to be pure, the real deal. Disciples who've weighed up the cost and commit to following Jesus. Salt has many great properties, as I'm sure you know. And we're called to be like salt. Salt preserves, and we must preserve God's word and share its truth. In a world that wants to change it and water it down, our job is to preserve it as if we were salt. Salt purifies, and we must live to bring purity into this broken world and point people to Jesus and away from the impurity. Salt's an antiseptic, and we must work to heal broken lives and broken spirits like those in Ukraine whose lives are being torn apart. We're called to be salt to them. Salt make people thirsty, and we must live so that others thirst after the Lord Jesus and his salvation. If we're not living like this, are we truly following Jesus? For those that are, we've said there are great rewards. This is good news. Everything that you sacrifice for Jesus in this life will receive so much more in the next life and, of course, blessings now. And as we can turn in with Jesus, continue with Jesus towards the end of the road, let us stay close to him. Stay a true disciple who has counted the cost and is prepared to carry their own cross. In Ukraine and Russia this morning, there are Christians who today are disciples of Jesus who know firsthand what it is to be carrying a cross, to fight in the cost of following Jesus. In our situation, we might find it hard to understand about the true cost. But understand it we must, so that we will be ready to continue to follow Jesus, even in the most difficult circumstances that we may follow. And right there at the end, before he continued on that journey towards Jerusalem, Jesus said this, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Friends, Jesus has been speaking, and I hope we've each of us been listening. We cannot be his disciples unless we put him above all other relationships. We cannot be his disciples unless we're prepared to die to self and carry our own cross. It's part of the journey, it's part of the deal. And we cannot be his disciples unless we have weighed up the cost and given up everything to follow him. When we do, the rewards always outweigh the cost. And we thank God that we can follow Jesus now and know his blessing and reward and look forward to eternity with hope and certainty and along the way we can be salt to a very needy world next week as we journey with jesus we're on the border between samaria and galilee as we look at the subject of thankfulness until then let us pray father we thank you this morning we thank you for the warning that you give to us about the cost of being a disciple but Father, thank you too that it comes with so many blessings, so much reward. And Father, this morning I pray for each of us that we might be committed, having counted the cost, that we might be found to be your disciples. That Father, we might be salt in this world, that we might make a difference, that we might follow you, that we might be prepared to carry our cross, knowing the blessings now and in the future which come from serving and following you. Take our lives, Lord. Use them this week and in the coming days in whatever way you choose, we offer ourselves all that we have and all that we are to you in your service. In the name of Jesus. Amen.